and get on with Bible study. Right, it says that we are live. If, uh, oh, we got two people watching, so maybe someone can confirm that they can hear me on the internet. I'm guessing that'll be Liz's job. In the meantime, let's open in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day and for your goodness and grace. Thank you for your word and your faithfulness to us, Lord. As we continue to study uh, the infrastructure behind your word, Lord, we do pray that you lead and guide us into all truth and that you would comfort us again with your gospel. In your name we pray, amen. All right, so we're going to continue on with our introduction to Luke Acts. I am still working up our customized uh, outline that we're going to follow for an abbreviated study. We're not going to go verse by verse through what I think is the two longest books in the entire New Testament. Uh, that's a task too great for us to endure. Uh, I, I get visions of God sending food to Elijah in the wilderness saying it is too much, rest and eat. Uh, we're not going to do that. We're going to have an abbreviated study looking through uh, one of a couple of different lenses I'm trying to develop without shoehorning uh, something into the text that isn't there. So hopefully in two weeks, uh, I will have that ready. As a reminder, no Bible study next week, uh, as I will be in South Dakota speaking at Pickerel Senior Camp. Uh, but in two weeks, we will have study again. So that's where we're at. That's the update. This is where we left off last time talking about what is uh, Luke's writing, what category, what is a gospel, what is the book of Acts, and what is Luke writing about. The key point here is the, uh, the idea that Luke is pointing to Jesus Christ and teaching us about the kingdom of God. That is the uniting force really behind Luke and Acts. And, and uh, that's kind of our launching pad. So that's where we left off two weeks ago. Now we're going to do the when and the where. Uh, Acts, Luke and Acts are, are more or less dated to the last half of the 50s AD. Or uh, if you're an academic snob from the last 30 years, the 50s CE. Uh, you remember that, that academia has gotten rid of the terms uh, BC and AD, and now it's BCE and CE. Uh, it's before Common Era and Common Era are the new dating scheme. All the years stayed the same, but, but, but certain atheists wanted to get before Christ and Anno Domini in the year of our Lord out of whatever. It's dumb. Uh, so we go B.C. and A.D. Luke and Acts were probably written back to back in between 55 and 60 A.D., uh, which means they were probably at the very least compiled, if not the first drafts written, during Paul's second and third missionary journeys. So when we get into the book of Acts and we get into the last half of the book of Acts, uh, I'm going to really try to bend over backwards to point out when things might have been written. And again, if you remember from two weeks ago, we have the very fascinating probability uh, that when Paul was in Ephesus, that's described in the book of Acts, Luke was interviewing Mary for the background for the Gospel of Luke. And we have all of those fun things. So this is a map that none of you can see from your seats, but it's uh, Paul's first and second missionary journeys. The uh, second missionary journey is purple and red. It's the big outside loop Paul leaves Antioch, goes up through the Turkish peninsula or Asia Minor. He scoots into Greece and then he comes back via the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, and then the, th oops, I didn't want to do that. Oops, I did want to do that. Go back there. That's his third missionary journey. I do not know why it's so much bigger. Uh, I still haven't mastered the uh, Mac uh, version of PowerPoint yet. But again, Paul traces almost the same route as his second missionary journey, except for when he reaches Greece, instead of just hightailing at home via the Mediterranean Sea, he goes back up and almost retraces his route. Uh, so that's the uh, second missionary journey. And if you have a similar map uh, to 
uh, in the back of your Bible, you can kind of get some of those cities. So that's the geography. That's the where Luke wrote it. Here's the timeline. And I think we just barely touched on this two weeks ago. Uh, third missionary journey is dated 54 to 57, uh, which means uh, basically once they get back to Jerusalem, Luke is just appending the book of Acts as it happens. And, and you will notice that those last uh, few chapters of the book of Acts, uh, we talked about Luke switching from the they to the we pronouns. Last part of the book of Acts is almost exclusively we when they travel. So Luke is with Paul writing in real time what happens. So, so this is the timeline we're going. Uh, I, I really wanted to... Uh, find, uh, I saw somewhere and I didn't save it and, I, and I'm really upset. One of my, my big fascinations as a pastor is overlapping world history with biblical history and, and some of the major events that are going on in the world that the Bible doesn't touch on at all, but just to see where it goes. So in, in the, the early 40s, which is the church kind of just gaining a foothold in the Middle East, you're looking at the emperor Caligula. Uh, and then Caligula gives way to uh, Tiberius. And in the late 40s, 50s-ish, that's when Nero jumps onto the scene. And, and Nero uh, goes until, what, the mid to late 60s is, is when he finally just loses grip with reality and, and is assassinated or commits suicide or can't remember how it goes. Uh, and then the other well, yeah, but also he got much worse. <laughs> uh, so the mid-60s is, is especially when Rome burns down, Nero blames the Christians for that, and he starts using uh, Christians as a source of light in garden parties, he coats them with tar and lights them on fire and suspends them over his garden parties, all that horrendous stuff. Uh, all that leads up to the... 60 to 67, Ro Paul is in Rome and, and, and presumably dies right as Rome, uh, right as the empire begins to invade Israel and invade Jerusalem because of the rebellion in the mid-60s. So all this is going on. It's really fascinating to, to see how this all ties together with Paul's writing and with John's writing in the New Testament, but I don't have that timeline and I wish I did. So anyway, that's the when and the where. The big question for us, though, is why did Luke write uh, Luke and Acts? What is the purpose behind it? What are the reasons? And, and, and what you really find out is that there are four reasons for four distinct audiences, and they complete a full circle for us. And we're going to see elements of this all the way through Luke and Acts. I think this is really, really important for us to identify as we see uh, the, the theme and the narrative of Luke and Acts progress when we finally get into the text. The first reason uh, Luke wrote Luke and Acts is the homiletical. What's, what is homiletical referring to? Now, if you guys were all Bible school students right now and, and you wanted to write about this, you would start a paper in class with Dictionary.com, or Merriam Webster, defines homiletical as, and I, what's homiletical? Preaching. Homiletical pertains to preaching. It's where, it's the same root word as we get homily, which is uh, a sort of a sermon. Uh, and, and a homiletical purpose is Luke wrote Luke and Acts for baptized Christians, for established members of the church mature in their faith. Uh, we see a lot of that, uh, especially uh, in how Luke records some of Jesus' teachings, is, is Luke anticipates that the church is going to use his writing. And, and so we see some of that going forward. But we see more <coughs> of the second category. I think this is the main category, catechetical. What does catechetical mean? Referring to the catechism, which means what does catechetical mean? Referring to the catechism is fine, but it doesn't do us any good. It's like defining a word with a word. 
civil teachings. These are the, the foundational truths of the faith. That's what the catechism is. In fact, uh, uh, catechetical, uh, catechism all come from this Greek word kateko. And uh, it's uh, the, where we get our English word echo, uh, back and forth. And, and kateko, that, that type of teaching, is that you would sound back and forth the teaching. So the teacher would say something and the student would echo back an expected answer, which is exactly how the catechism is structured. It's Luther's, what does this mean? Or if you go into any of the explanations in, in, in the AFLC, we have our own catechism and you have Sverdrup's explanation of the catechism. And those are like the couple hundred questions and the second half of the catechism, right? So that's what we're doing. So most of Luke's writing is for baby Christians. Uh, much of it, uh, you will see Luke taking concepts in scripture, concepts in the church, and explaining it. And so very often, when Luke refers back to the Old Testament or back to an image from the Old Testament, he stops and takes time to explain what it means. Uh, and, and again, you see that a lot in Luke, and you see that a lot in the early chapters of, of Acts, and, and especially in Acts, you see it, Luke goes out of his way to delineate a, a, and show the teaching of the early apostles. And so like Acts chapter 8 is a major chapter in the book of Acts. And that's where Philip uh, gets, uh, gets uh, you know, Star Trek the uh, Energizer and he just gets dropped right into the Ethiopian's chariot, so to speak, and teaches them the purpose of... Uh, of uh, Isaiah 53, or you see it at the end of Luke's gospel on the way to Emmaus when Jesus explains to the disciples everything the Old Testament says about him. That, those are major features in the book of Luke and the book of Acts. So uh, they, they're written from a catechetical perspective. They're written for baby Christians. Okay? Third reason, this is again up there, but it's not as formative as catechetical. It's evangelical. This is uh, written to convince people to believe in Jesus. And so we're kind of hijacking John's verse from John 20, that these are written that you might believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you might have life in his name. We see a lot of that in Luke and Acts. It's not necessarily the most dominant reason. Uh, one, of the, one of the ways you see this is uh, uh, Luke highlights in the book of Acts, Paul always contending first in the synagogues and then in the public squares that Jesus is the Christ over and over and over again. And, and it's, he's inviting people to believe. He's inviting people to believe. That overlaps with the, the, the last reason why Luke would write, and that's apologetic. And apologetics is for skeptics. It's a defense of the faith. It's to prove things that people would be prone to doubt. And so especially the last, what, two or three chapters of Acts, Paul is testifying before uh, Felix and uh, King Agrippa. And, and it's, I, I just always find it fascinating that he gets this close to getting King Agrippa to believe in Jesus. And, and Agrippa throws up his hands and says, Paul, do you think so quickly you could get me to believe in Jesus? And Paul basically says, yeah, you know, <laughs> a little bit more eloquently than that. So, so that's our kind of our chart, what we're going to be looking at. Any questions or comments with this? Okay. So that's the why. And now we got, how did Luke write it? What's the composition? And, and I, I did a kind of a, a, a thought exercise in this. This has limited value for our study but I also think it's really cool. I, I love these things. So I did a word cloud uh, for uh, the book of Luke and the book of Acts. And a word cloud just analyzes the text and pulls out the most frequent words and it tosses out like the and prepositions and stuff. So this is for the book of Luke and the, the, the big ones is will. Uh, and again, I don't know if that's you will do something or the will of God. English doesn't help us with that. I was going to do the Greek, but I didn't think anyone would care about that. Uh, so uh, the Jesus takes a prominent place in the book of Luke. Uh, 
<laughs> my favorite one is at the very top of the cross, things. Uh, I, I guarantee uh, that if I gave a test when I was teaching Bible school classes and I had on the test, what is the book of Luke about, some wiseacre student would say things. And I guess they would be right, okay? So, so the reason why I did this is because I wanted to compare it to the book of Acts and see where the overlap was. And this is where there's limited value because Acts has a different context and has a different focus, but it's still the same author. And so maybe we can see what themes pop up. So here's the book of Acts. Uh, and uh, Paul takes a prominent, prominent place. God, uh, I found it interesting in this that God was much more prominent than Jesus in the book of Acts. And, and I'm wondering if we're going to see that as we go through the text. That, that I wonder if it has to do with Paul uh, going to the divinity of Jesus or, or, or what it is. Uh, but there's a lot of people. Jerusalem. Will also shows up again. That was the first thing I noticed is the prominence of Will in the book of Acts. So uh, we'll see some of these bear out again. This has limited value for a serious study of these two books, but I think it's fun. And, and, and more or less, I'm just proud that I figured out how to do this. So I wasn't going to waste it. Uh, I, I'm pretty uh, technically illiterate. So it was fun to find a website that did this for me. <coughs> yeah. Yeah, in the book of Acts, right? Yeah, spirit is, uh, yeah, it's really small compared to some words. And yeah, and, and you would kind of wonder, like, assemblies of God people, like, have you ever read Acts beyond chapter two? <laughs> you know, that, that sort of thing. Uh, but yeah, that, that is really interesting to note. Uh, the Holy Spirit isn't uh, not prominent, but it's, yeah, it's kind of second level, third level frequency. Any other things that jump out? Okay. So how did Luke write Acts? What is the composition look like. And there are three main motifs or themes that unite Luke and Acts with the rest of Scripture. So with each other, with the rest of Scripture. And, and that being said, I'm not going to use any three or any of these three themes because I think there's a bigger one that we're going to look at. Okay, so we're going to go down the chart with each of these themes and, and kind of identify them as they show up. So the first theme or first motif is the journey motif. The traveling from one place to another place at the call of God. So, in Scripture, and, and maybe I should say, in particularly the Old Testament, where do we see the journey motif? So the Exodus is the main journey motif, right? From Egypt to the Promised Land. And, and, and that takes up a, a big chunk of Old Testament imagery. What other journeys are there, though? Yeah, Abraham is a pretty big journey going from Ur of the Chaldeans all the way to the Promised Land, then to Egypt, then back to the Promised Land. He's bouncing all over the place. So the Abraham journey is the first big one. Uh, you could maybe go back a little further and say the journey from Eden to not in Eden, but the journey isn't really highlighted there. The same with the Tower of Babel. Okay, so we've got Abraham we got Exodus. I came up with four big journeys. Abraham and Exodus were the first two. What are some of the other ones? So Jacob, yeah. So Jacob goes back and then for, for uh, Rachel and Leah. So that would be a big one, yep. Okay, so the exile is the last big one, right? So exile to Babylon and then back to the promised land, back to Jerusalem. Uh, the other big one I got that I, I it, it might not seem like big as it happens, but it's really big from a preaching perspective is Elijah. What was Elijah's journey? Yeah, so Mount Carmel to the wilderness to Mount Sinai or Mount Horeb and then back to Jerusalem. Yeah, so 
This journey motif, this idea of moving around at the call of God, is a big idea in Scripture. Okay, So now Luke and Acts uh, both have journey motifs. Okay, the, the big journey in Luke is, again, it's a metaphorical journey, but it's also a real journey, is Jesus' journey from heaven to earth to heaven. Now, it's, it's an actual journey, the incarnation and then the ascension. Okay? Uh, the other one, the, the last half of the book of Luke, features Jesus' final journey into Jerusalem. And that's a, a major structural feature of the book of Luke, is Luke makes quite a bit of Jesus' journey into Jerusalem. And we're going to highlight that. In Acts, uh, there are a couple big journeys. The first one, Acts 1.8. What's the first journey? It's the Great Commission. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in Samaria, and Judea, and then to the ends of the earth. It's a, it's a pre-journey. It prefigures the gospel. You also have the journey of the dispersion as the Jews are scattered because of Saul, who becomes Paul. And of course, what are the big remaining journeys in Acts? Yeah, one, two, and three, right? Paul traveling to spread the gospel. And so there's, again, that journey motif, that idea of traveling at the call of God. All right, any questions with that? So I've got a final one here. I want to see if you guys pick up on it. What's the journey motif in the life of a Christian? In these letters, Paul writes to talk about Christianity and church, using the word walk. Yeah, so, so Christianity is a walk, but then you tie that in. It's a walk from where to where. Yeah, so from death to life, and then from life to death, and then from death to eternity. So that's what the Christian walk looks like, and you get this sense in that, that there, there's some real locations going on, because we are not citizens of this world. We are strangers and aliens. Our citizenship is in heaven, in eternity, okay? So that, that's... It's a not unfamiliar theme for the Christian life. And we start to see how Scripture ties things together for us. So that's the journey motif. Okay. Second one is the prophet motif, the prophet theme. In the Old Testament, do we find the theme of the prophet highlighted? Once or twice or a couple thousand times, right? So the major prophets we would say in the Old Testament are? Okay, literally the major prophets. Thank you, Philip. Uh, the, the highlighted prophets in the Old Testament would be? So Moses and Elijah, the prophets of the transfiguration. In fact, Moses says in Deuteronomy, God will raise up a prophet just like me. Uh, Elijah is kind of the, the typical prophet of the Old Testament. Elijah in the New Testament is fulfilled by John the Baptist. And then uh, finally you have the actual prophets. The, an entire section of scripture in the Old Testament is made up of the prophets. They're called the preaching prophets the prophets who deliver the word of God. So there is a, a prophetic theme. Uh, and again, this is time for us to clear up. Uh, and, and we got to do it at every opportunity we have because if we don't, we, the narrative kind of carries us away. The main job of a prophet is what? To speak the word of the Lord. Okay, if you ask random person on the street, the main job of a prophet is to predict the future. If you go to these kind of fringy Christian denominations where prophet is an office, that prophet is occupied 
with relaying the future and communicating a unique message from God. Now, in Scripture, the, the main role of the prophet is to relay the word of God as it was delivered, right? And so uh, that's the feature. We go into Luke. Who's the prophet in Luke? Jesus is the prophet. How do we see Jesus acting as prophet in the Gospels? I won't even limit you to Luke's Gospel because they're all covering the same material. How do we see Jesus as prophet in the Gospels? What? So he's God and he talks. So when Jesus speaks, you, know, you and Philip are going to have some problems here. You, you're cutting in on each other's territories a little bit. Yeah. Anytime Jesus speaks, it's scripture. Okay. Uh, John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the, and the word was with, and the word was. Okay. So we have that. How else do we see Jesus acting as prophet? So he's God and he talks. What else? Do we find Jesus taking up the office of preacher? What? Sermon on the Mount, the parables, everything along those. Is Jesus teaching his people about Scripture? Yeah, it's a major role in the Gospels and especially in the Gospel of Luke, okay? In Acts, who is the prophet? It's not a trick question. I just made it sound like that to re- kind of make you guys nervous. Peter and, Paul. Peter and Paul, but the church. The church takes up the mantle of prophecy. So you've got Peter preaches a sermon in Luke or in Acts chapter 2. Uh, who's the next one to preach in Acts after Peter? Stephen? Stephen? Stephen, we're going to argue about that to no end in Acts 7. Acts 8, who's the prophet? Just talked about this. Philip, and then Paul takes over, right? But in, uh, in Acts, we see the role of the prophet handed off to the church, and the church's job is not to generate new scripture, although it's being generated as Paul uh, is inspired to write the rest of the New Testament and Luke and John and all those guys, it's to apply scripture to the church. So we see that now in the Christian life, where does the prophet come up? Church still. (laughs) Where? The pastor. So I will argue this until I'm blue in the face, and I've gotten pushed back, and and I think it's fair to push back on this. I think when the New Testament talks about the spiritual gift of prophecy in Romans 12, uh, in Romans 14, 1 Corinthians 14, and all the other places where it talks about prophecy as a spiritual gift, I think it's talking about preaching. Uh, I think having a gift to preach is something the Spirit gives to preachers. Nowhere do we have any hint that, that people were predicting the future. Now, what we will say is that there are certain prophets in the book of Acts, and Agabus at the end, or Abagus or Agabus, I think it's Agabus, uh, at the end of the book of Acts, predicts Paul will be taken to Roman chains, essentially, right? But who delivered that message to him? The Holy Spirit, Right? Okay. So we, we still see it happening, but, but that's my argument. So in the Christian life, the, the theme of prophecy is one of preaching, which means if I do my job, I deliver to you the word of God and I point you to Jesus. If I don't do my job, I fail at that. Okay. So the final theme or motif we're going to trace in Luke and Acts is the feast. The theme of the feast. And this, again, is one in Scripture that is all over the place. So, where do we see the feast in the Old Testament? No. 
It does not. <laughs> We could do the potluck. Seems a little less spiritual. <laughs> and the purpose is different while it is still the same. Yeah, with the potluck motif. Also, because some weird places would call it a smorgasbord, and that's just weird. So there's the feasts of the Levitical year. We're, 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 that's actually the wrong direction from Passover. But yes, what is the first feast? Well, so the Garden of Eden, every tree is given for food except the knowledge of good and evil. Okay? All right, so there's that. The next feast of real significance is Abraham. When the three visitors come and Abraham makes a feast. And so you have the symbolism of the Trinity. You have feasting with God, God giving the blessing of a son. All of that's going on in Genesis. And then there's other feasts. Joseph's brothers reconcile with Joseph at a feast. Okay? Uh, from there, then you have all of the, the Moses feasts. So you have the Passover that Philip jumped to. Then you have the feasts of the liturgical year in uh, Le Leviticus and Deuteronomy. Uh, in between, uh, there are feasts of grace and feasts of punishment. So you have the manna, it's a feast of grace in the wilderness. Right after the manna, what's the feast of punishment? The quail. God prophesying, telling, you will have so much meat, it will come out of your ears and your nose. Uh, kind of vivid imagery, okay? So you have all of those feasts. From there, you have the tabernacle and the temple. Where are the feasts in the tabernacle and the temple? So you have the table of the showbread, or the bread of the presence, and... You have the, some of the sacrifice are given to the, to the Levites as their allotment, their food. It's the, in fact, the entire tabernacle experience, you could make a very reasonable argument, is built around the concept of the feast. Uh, I, I think it would be slightly askew, but you could make an argument for it, okay? Uh, the last big feast that I wanted to highlight in the Old Testament is David and Mephibosheth. So who is Mephibosheth? And does anyone want to try to say Mephibosheth publicly? <laughs> Jonathan's remaining son, who in the flight during the, the coup, during the overthrow, his nurse dropped him and crippled him. And then when David is king, now again, in the ancient world, and anywhere in the ancient world, if you're a king and you find out your predecessor has a living heir, what do you do? You kill him. That's just good sense, right? What does David do for Mephibosheth? What? Yeah, Mephibosheth eats at David's table for the remainder of his life. And it's, a, it's an amazing picture of the gospel. A, a lame son of a rebel is welcome to the king's table. I mean, it's all sorts of gospel images in that. So that's the feast motif in the Old Testament. In Luke, where do we see feasting? So the Last Supper, yeah, the Last Supper is the last one. So Holy Communion is the fulfillment of the feast theme until we get to eternity where it will be the Wedding Supper of the Lamb. Uh, what else are the feasts in Luke? Jesus, Jesus feeds the multitudes. Okay, good. Jesus eats with the Pharisees and with the tax collectors. So, he, so he, again, we, we can explode this into the whole gospel. Jesus eats with Matthew and with Zacchaeus, but he also eats with Simon the Pharisee. It's really, really interesting. That's, all of those are built around the feast motif. What about the book of Acts? Yeah. 
God legalizing bacon. Big moment in biblical history. Uh, Rise and eat. And Peter says, Lord, I've not eaten anything unclean. He does it three times. The interesting thing is uh, God wasn't necessarily talking to Peter about food, even though he was, but it's this, this uh, theme of fellowship and, and welcoming people into the fellowship. In fact, we're told that bacon gets legalized by Jesus earlier on. It's a side comment in one of the Gospels. But, so the vision of the sheet and the animals, where else are the feasts? Revelation. So, Revelation, wedding supper of the Lamb. What? No, I'm an axe, but yeah, Revelation's fine. Uh, works. I'm not going to argue it. Uh, Acts 2.42. What's the first thing the organized church does after exploding in numbers? They share food, breaking of bread together. Right? And that might be communion. It might not be communion. It's probably both. Right? And then in individual instances, there, there's all sorts of eating. Right? In the Christian life, then, uh, there are three main feasts. We'll give less and assist for one of them, the potluck. Okay? What are the other two main feasts in the Christian life? I, I think so. Well, <laughs> I, 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 don't, I, I don't know that I'll ev- elevate the potluck to doctrinal status, but I, I think it's something to celebrate, the fellowship meal. Holy Communion is the main feast in the Christian life, eating at the Lord's table. What's the other feast? Think about it. Think catechetically. Our daily bread. bread. Give us this day our daily bread. And so the feast motif is extended to each and every way that God provides for us. What are you guys laughing at? Me? Me? Obviously, I need specific reasons, though. <laughs> so, any questions on that? That's our introduction to Luke and Acts. In two weeks, we'll break down our outline and, and jump into uh, probably Zechariah and Elizabeth. So, any other questions? Um, when you're talking about the feast motif in the Old Testament, would you count? No. So I can't count all sacrifices because some sacrifices, the whole sacrifice was burned up, right? But you, you had, wasn't there? Yeah, but God eats those. Well, God smells those. <laughs> Is it? Interesting. I'm not, I didn't catch that. Yeah, look it up. Proof text me out of that one. Uh, but, but, but you have the grain offering and the wave offering and the thank offering are all given to the Levites as their allotment. So, yeah, I don't know if we would just say the sacrifice and the feast are even, they're definitely connected, but they're, they're not a one-for-one equivalency. Good question, though. Oh, chat has moved to the bottom of the screen, uh, which I found out uh, Liz got Mephibosheth before everyone. Liz also got Esther for feasting in the Old Testament. That's a good one, feasting that the, the Jewish people were saved because of the feast between the king and Esther and Haman. Uh, Liz also has prayer requests. So we'll get to that in a second. Uh, they're very good prayer requests. Um, Steve, did you find it? No. Okay. Yeah, I did. Okay. Leviticus 21.6. All right. And, and I think if you wanted to get really metaphorical with them, you take like the, the sacrifice Samson's parents, Manoah, and his wife offer. And when the angel, the angel of the Lord ascends to heaven, he consumes the offering so that it disappears. I don't know. It's, it's exactly eating. Close, close enough. Yeah. I, I don't think we're committing heresy. So I was wrong. We'll go with that. All right. So as I said, I'm not doing any three of these themes. 
what I'm going to try to do is to build an outline on Luke and Acts that connects us back to the minor prophets. Because this is kind of our interlude with the minor prophets. I think, uh, I read through Luke and I read through Acts straight through, which is, Pastor Haugen taught me to do that in seminary. If you really want to get a sense of the flow of the book, you read it from beginning to end. You try to ignore the verse breaks and so on. I think I can build an outline on the day of the Lord. Uh, I, I, I'm pretty sure it was there enough, so I don't think I'm, I'm forcing it. If I can't, I know for certain I can build an outline on the defense of the faith. So that's our backup. Uh, and so we'll have one of the, two of those structures. And my goal in going through Luke and Acts is to have a symmetrical outline of Luke and Acts. So if we have 14 units in Luke, we'll have 14 units in Acts. Uh, and it probably won't be any longer than that. We're going to be sp skipping quite a bit of material, because otherwise we'll just be on it forever, because I won't be able to help myself. So uh, that's where we're at. Uh, Liz has prayer requests, so Liz, I will get them to the group, uh, and I'm going to shut down the stream, and then we're going to have prayer time.